So, as she said, this talk is about a merge of two papers. The first one by Prapanshan, Ayush, and Amit, and the second one by Rachel and me. And I'll start the presentation and then hand over to Ayush for the second part. The goal of both papers was to construct uh, indistinguishability obfuscation without relying on multilinear maps. And they both introduce a new type of uh, pseudo-randomness and use uh, security amplification. Obfuscation takes a program, uh, say represented as a circuit that computes a function and turns it into another circuit that computes the same function such that this is uh, unintelligible. There are different ways how this can be formalized and the guarantee IO gives you is that if you have two circuits that compute the same function, then their obfuscations are indistinguishable. Intuitively, this means that implementation differences in these circuits are hidden. And as we know by now, this notion is extremely useful and has tremendous applications in cryptography. While we can already do many cool things without I.O., as we know, if you are allowed to use I.O. and just some additional minimal things, then this opens a whole new world of amazing things, for many of which we don't know how to do them without I.O. So whether and under which assumptions I.O. exists is an extremely important question. First constructions of uh, I.O. relied on multilinear maps, which themselves are a very complex object, which has led to many candidates for multilinear maps and attacks on these candidates and new candidates, new attacks, and so on, and also direct attacks on these constructions and the new constructions that try to resist these attacks and more attacks, and so on. So this is kind of an unsatisfactory situation. So what we would like to do is we want to avoid using multilinear maps and instead rely on assumptions that are easier to analyze and understand. There's been an impressive line of uh, previous research that has managed to bring down the degree needed for the multilinear maps from polynomial degree down to constant and ultimately degree just three. So what is known so far is that we can get I.O. from three linear maps, a simple type of PHG and LWE. So our goal was to now go just one step further and reduce the degree to two. Because for bilinear maps, we have uh, good candidates and these are well understood. And so these are our results. We essentially do get I.O. from bilinear maps. And again, this block local PHGs and LWE. But we also have to add some new assumption, which is essentially a new type of uh, randomness generator that has some weak uh, hiding property and a simple structure. And we'll discuss this in more detail. But I first want to give you a very brief intuition about how our construction works. The starting point of our construction, as well as for previous I.O. construction, is that I.O. is implied by um, compact functional encryption. Functional encryption itself is a very fascinating object. It allows you to encrypt some value x. And then given a secret key for function f, you can decrypt to obtain f of x. And the security guarantee is that you learn nothing about x beyond f of x. And compactness here means that the size of the ciphertext grows at most sublinearly in the size of the functions we want to compute. So we only have to construct such an fe scheme and we need to uh, do this for functions in NC0. So how can we construct such an FE scheme? The basic approach here is to compare this to homomorphic encryption, which has a similar structure. It also allows you to encrypt some value x, and then anyone can compute functions f on this uh, ciphertext and then obtain a ciphertext for f of x. And so the difference here is that the ciphertext, of course, reveals nothing about f of x. So we need to find a way to decrypt the ciphertext in such a way that this only reveals f of x, but not x. And so the idea how we can do this is to again use uh, functional encryption to do this decryption. Now, for this to make sense, uh, since we want to construct fe, of course, this fe should be for a much simpler class of functions. And in that case, we obtain a bootstrapping from a simple fe to full fe. And this is also an approach that has been used before in different FE constructions. Now, the crucial question here is how simple this FE scheme can be. Right? So the simpler, uh, the better. And what it essentially needs to be able to do is to evaluate the decryption of a homomorphic encryption scheme. 
And luckily, there are LWE-based homomorphic encryption schemes that have a very simple decryption. They essentially just compute an inner product, and then if we uh, encrypt bits, uh, reduce modulo 2. And so the inner product is very simple. Modulo 2, in principle, is also simple, but not if you want to express it as a polynomial of low degree. So what we can do, we can just say, okay, let's not do the modulo 2. Let's only compute the inner product. If we do that, we obtain f of x, which we want, plus some noise. Okay, the issue with this is that this uh, noise contains information about x. So we cannot just give this out uh, in public. We need to find a way to hide this noise to make this secure. And the idea how we want to hide this is, is we just add some random value to it, such that the sum uh, hopefully hides this uh, value e. And this is an approach that has also been used before and is known as noise flooding or noise smudging. And so this uh, randomness that we add here, this is precisely where we use this new type of randomness generator that I mentioned before. So the question now how simple this FE scheme can be directly relates to how simple it is to generate this randomness. So we want to make sure that it's as simple as possible and still able to hide this E. And well, our candidates essentially have degree 2.5, and I'll say later what, what this means. So how can we construct such a, a simple FE scheme? Starting point is that it's known that bilinear maps uh, imply degree 2 functional encryption, and by massaging these schemes appropriately, we manage to extend them such that they also work for degree 2.5. So that's great. Um, Caveat here is that for these schemes, the outputs must be small. Uh, small means polynomial in the security parameter. And the reason is that they do computations in the exponent of some group. And if you want to decrypt, you essentially have to extract this exponent by brute force, which you can only do if this is from a small set. So if you want to use this approach, the randomness we can generate also must be small. OK, so let's do it with small randomness. Problem with that is that the small randomness cannot entirely hide this E. As an example, just look at a one-dimensional case where we have a, a uniform value in the interval minus B2B. Now, if we shift this by one, then essentially at these corner cases, the value E is revealed. Right? If the sum is minus B, we know that E must be zero. If the sum is B plus one, we know that E must have been one. And then if B is only polynomial, then this will happen with non eclipsable probability that we are in these this bad locations. And that's not only true for, for uniform distribution, but for other distributions as well with polynomial support. So that's kind of bad news. But there's also some good news. Namely, if we are not in this red area, then E is actually hidden. Right? So for example, if the sum is 0, we have no clue what E was. OK, so our goal is now to kind of formalize what this means to hide this noise in a weak sense and then obtain a functional encryption scheme with some weak security, which we then amplify. And so the, the two papers have like different approaches to generate this randomness and then also for the, for the amplification. And I'll now uh, briefly talk about what we call pseudo-flood smudging generators. They take a, a short seed, which are uh, n elements over set P and expand them to n to the 1 plus epsilon elements for some constant epsilon. And this stretch is basically what we need for the compactness of the FE scheme. And so the, the, the outputs must now, if you interpret them as integers, be of small magnitude to be able to do this brute force decryption. And the security guarantee we want from this is if we add a noise vector to this uh, output, then this sum should reveal E only at a few bad coordinates. And for all other coordinates, this E should be hidden. This is the, the basic intuition. OK, so now what's this degree 2.5? Essentially, what we do is we want this hiding property to still hold if we reveal part of the seed. And then computations over this public input, we only count half. Right, so this means we essentially have a degree 3 polynomial, but it's only degree 2 over secret inputs. So a bit more formally, the seed consists of a public and a private part. And we want that if 
you're given the public part of the seed, then the PFG output should be indistinguishable from some distribution phi that has this hiding property, which means that if you are given E plus phi, you cannot distinguish E from a fresh sample E prime that is equal to E only on this few bad coordinates. And then you're also told this set I, which is which coordinates are bad. This is essentially the, the PFG notion we have. Um, and in fact, it's enough if this property holds with some one over poly probability. Now, if we use this in our construction, what we obtain is an FE scheme that leaks the input x at some bad coordinates, but at other coordinates, the, the x is hidden. And now, uh, we have to essentially amplify this, this security to deal with this leakage. And to do so, we introduce a new primitive, which is a special type of homomorphic secret sharing that we call bit fixing uh, homomorphic sharing. This allows us to basically share the inputs and uh, do this in a clever way to uh, deal with this leakage. But I don't have time to discuss this in detail. And we'll now uh, hand over to Ayush, who will tell you more about uh, the assumptions and their construction. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so my co-author, Christian, uh, talked about the overall approach that these two works follow. And uh, he also told about two aspects uh, in which the R works differ, namely the randomness generation aspect uh, and the hardness amplification aspect. Um, and towards the end, he was talking about the notion of uh, pseudo flood smudging generator. Uh, now let me talk about uh, how these aspects are handled by our work. Um, and in particular, let me uh, start with the notion of a perturbation resilient generator. So a perturbation resilient generator is also a non-Boolean PRG, just like, uh, just like a PFG. And the syntax is uh, almost identical to as, as that of a PFG. In particular, uh, the delta RG, uh, uh, this takes as input n fields element as input, and it outputs n to the 1 plus epsilon integers for some positive epsilon. So these parameters are, are set such that uh, this uh, PRG is expanding. Um, then, uh, as Christian was uh, talking about, the seed has a definitive stru structure. So seed can be formatted as, uh, as two parts. There is a public part, and, that, and, the, and there is a private part. And then the, the PRG um, assumes uh, a structure that is degree two computation over the private part, whereas the total degree can be three. Um, and Christian was also mentioning about it that the output of the PRG is going to be polynomially bounded. However, uh, the security notions uh, in these two uh, objects uh, are slightly different. Uh, we define the notion of perturbation resilience where um, think about uh, a set of permutations delta, where deltas are bounded by, let's say, n. Um, then it happens that following two distributions are mildly indistinguishable. In the first distribution, you have the public part of the seed along with the PRG output. Uh, in the second distribution, we have the public part of the seed again. But now, uh, the PRG output is perturbed with these values delta. And we're, what we ask for is a very modest form of indistinguishability. Uh, that is, um, we ask that for any uh, computationally bounded adversary A, uh, the probability with which an adversary can distinguish between these two distributions is bounded by a probability as high as 0.99. Now let me uh, proceed on to uh, talking about the assumptions on which you can build such an object. So our assumption actually builds on a variant of LWE, where uh, let's say you have an R distribution chi, which has a standard uh, polynomially bounded standard deviation uh, of n. Now you can think of uh, some parameters for the prime as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the dimension. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with parameters, but uh, w what we have uh, is uh, so what LW says is that uh, we have uh, this tuple which is set of vectors AI along with inner product of AI with the secret added with some error E. This tuple looks pseudo random. So unfortunately, we do not quite know how to build IO uh, based on LW, but what we can do is uh, base it on an assumption where 
we got, give out these LW samples along with this uh, leakage on the error and two independently sampled vectors y and z. So, we give out, um, so we give out this uh, LW sample and this polynomial leakage um, which is going to be actually a degree 3 polynomial on the error and uh, these two variables y and z. In the next slide, I will make formal how these polynomials look like and what is the assumption that we need. So, um, uh, now I am going to talk about what those polynomials correspond to and uh, in fact, there is a lot of slack on how, on how, on how we can um, cons use, uh, how can instantiate these polynomials and uh, we have a couple of instantiation which you can look in the paper. Uh, for this talk, let me be very concrete and give you a very, uh, a, a single candidate and the candidate is, uh, is just this. Uh, so, the sampler takes as input some parameter n and then it will output n to the 1.4 degree 3 polynomials. Here each polynomial uh, is going to have the following structure, each monomial ha has degree 1 in E, degree 1 in Y and degree 1 in Z. So, uh, they are homogeneous and degree 3 and linear in each variables. And then uh, the coefficients of these polynomials are randomly chosen from plus 1 and minus 1. Uh, finally, the the number of monomials that occur inside each polynomial is going to be uh, exactly n to the 0.1. So, let me repeat, uh, we have n to the 1.4 degree 3 polynomials, uh, where you form each polynomial by selecting n to the 0.1 monomials randomly like this and then randomly assigning plus 1 minus 1 signs for them and adding them up. So, with um, and so this candidate also can be used to instantiate both delta RG and PFG. But now let me uh, focus um, on the assumption that we can use to construct delta RG from, the, from this sampler. So, the assumption is really simple and it can actually fit in just one slide. The assumption just talks about indistinguishability of following two distributions. In the first distribution, you have LWE sampled, as I was talking about. And uh, along with that, we have the polynomials that were output by the sampler. They are evaluated on the error E along with two independently sampled vectors Y and Z also from the error distribution. In the second distribution, uh, we have LW samples as before. Uh, but now, uh, the polynomial samples QL uh, of E, Y and Z, they are perturbed with adversarially chosen values delta L. And again, uh, by adversarial, I mean that they are allowed to depend on the polynomial, but not on the error and Y and Z inputs uh, of, uh, of the seed. And, um, um, and, I, and what we ask is that these two distributions are very mildly indistinguishable. Uh, again, uh, very, by very mildly, I mean, I mean that for any adversary, uh, which is bound, efficiently bounded, uh, and the probability with which an adversary can distinguish between these two distributions is bounded by 0.99. So, in particular, our assumption can hold even if uh, an adversary can distinguish with 99 percent, but not beyond. And uh, I, I also like to mention why this 99 percent is uh, necessary. So, Christian already gave a uh, lot of intuition about it. Uh, the, the values of the polynomials, uh, the coefficients are, are plus 1, minus 1. Um, the inputs E, Y, and Z, they are bounded. So, the evaluation is going to be a bounded polynomial. So, with bounded polynomial, it is actually unreasonable to assume um, full security. Um, although we could have still assumed one by security parameter of uh, the indistinguishability, but we actually are very conservative and we ask for just 99 percent indistinguishability. All right. Uh, so, I told you about the assumption. Now, let me talk about how you can build uh, these objects uh, delta RG and a PFG from, from such polynomials and LWE samples. So, uh, this was our LWE sample, this was our uh, polynomial uh, leakage. Then, what we will do is that we will instantiate this, uh, this part, the LWE part, as the public part of the seed, and then we will, um, we will just let this be the PRG output, the polynomial evaluation. Um, now, observe that in order to go from LW sample to these polynomial leakages, all we need is a private part of the seed which looks like S tensor Y and Z. And it is using simple algebra, you can see that you can derive from C, a public part of the seed to the uh, PRG output 
using just degree two FP operations. I won't have time to talk about it, but you should, uh, it's really easy and you can look it in the paper for details. So uh, another aspect that I want to talk about is the hardness amplification aspect. Um, so as you saw that the assumptions that we have, they don't provide full security and there is always an advantage loss in, in either both these assumptions. So we actually need to build a machinery which uh, allows you to translate from a weak security to full security. Uh, and in, uh, in AJS work, what we can do is we can build a general compiler which says that if you are willing to assume sub-exponential hardness of LWE, uh, then you can um, go from, you can use a, uh, any, any functional encryption scheme with uh, weak security, that is advantage of one minus one by poly lambda, and you can uh, convert it uh, generically to a fully secure FE. And then using that, uh, we can okay, go all the way to IO. Um, the Lin and Matt work uh, is slightly different in this way. They, they use leakage resilient um, cryptographic techniques to uh, argue such an amplification for their scheme. Uh, so uh, there are new and beautiful ideas in both these work and I would, I would encourage you to look at the paper for details. All right, so with the remaining time left, let me just spend a couple of minutes on the kinds of cryptanalysis that we have done on these assumptions. So first, uh, we can already show some kind of sum of square lower bounds um, f against sub-exponential time uh, SDP adversaries, which apply to um, a mathematical problem which is very related to uh, these kind of assumptions. I will talk about it in, in the next slide. Uh, but, but what it shows is that um, we believe that uh, such a lower bound is, a, an, is an evidence of security against some of squares adversaries and also algorithms such as spectral uh, attacks and linear programming attacks just because they are known to be inferior to some of squares algorithm. And then uh, we also ran extensive gradient descent experiments and so far we were not, uh, we were not able to observe anything which seemed to be um, breaking our assumption. That said, um, gradient descent is, is an algorithm where uh, we actually need to come up with a theoretical framework by which we can analyze these things because it's really hard to uh, figure out uh, how powerful gradient descent can be. Uh, there are also algorithms about which we do not know how to reason about at all. So for example, uh, since we are giving out leakages in terms of LW sample and the polynomial evaluation, uh, a lattice attacks are very reasonable to uh, assume. However, we do just do not know how uh, to analyze either positively or negatively lattice attacks on this assumption. And finally, uh, there are also uh, hybrid attacks where you, will, we, you can use two different algorithms and, um, and use their results um, uh, to, to derive some kind of attack. For example, one reasonable strategy could be to use lattice algorithm in conjunction with sum of squares algorithm and uh, feed, it, uh, feed input of output of one algorithm to the other. But uh, again, we do not know how to argue about this. So the uh, takeaway point from this slide is that uh, this is really an open area and I would encourage all of you to think about crypto uh, analysis of these assumptions. Uh, finally, with uh, just one minute I have, let me talk about the sum of square lower bound that we can show. So this is uh, something that I also talked about in the crypto workshop uh, just a couple of days ago. And in a follow-up work with uh, Boaz, uh, Sam, Pravesh, and Amit, what we can show is that this is highly informal. What we can roughly show is that any sum of squares algorithm running, uh, algorithm running in time, which is uh, bounded sub-exponential, we cannot do the following. We can't take these leakages, uh, polynomial evaluations, and recover the output, uh, the input of the polynomial. And um, another, uh, an observation here is that uh, we have completely ignored LW leakage, and the reason for that is we just do not know how to incorporate um, the, any finite field arithmetic into the framework of sum of squares. And so this is also an interesting problem that uh, you should all think about. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude my talk and uh, please feel free to ask either me or Christian any of the questions you, ha you may have.
Any questions for the two speakers? Okay, let's thank all the three speakers of the session.